His fingers, as he passed, let go a music as of tunes blown tremulous in glass. Emily Dickinson's life is a study in contrasts. She wrote nearly 1,800 poems, but published very few in her lifetime. She lived her entire life in Amherst, Massachusetts, and never married, yet lived a vivid and often passionate life of the mind. Writer Martha Ackman's new book about Dickinson chronicles 10 pivotal moments in the poet's life. More than a biography, these fevered days reads like a novel as we see the world through Dickinson's eyes. There are so many myths about Dickinson, you know, that she lost out in love, that she was this waif of Amherst, um, that she lived upstairs in her father's bedroom and never came out. But in, in reading her letters, all of them, uh, all three volumes, over a thousand letters, you see a different portrait. Meticulously researched, 10 Fever Days immerses the reader in Emily Dickinson's world to show us the real person and poet beyond the myth. Martha Ackman, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about your book, These Fever Days, 10 Pivotal Moments in the Making of Emily Dickinson. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I really enjoyed the book, and but I think I just want to launch into asking you why Emily Dickinson? What made you fascinated with her? Uh, that is a very St. Louis story, let me tell you. I, uh, I, I grew up in, in St. Louis in Florissant, and uh, this sounds like I'm making it up, but it's the absolute truth. When I was uh, a junior at McClure High School, um, that was American literature. At, at, at the time, we read all American literature authors. And my English teacher at, at the time, Diane Brandon, um, uh, introduced us to Emily Dickinson. I'd never read her before. I loved literature, but I wasn't much on poetry. And in the big anthology that we had, uh, the poem, After Great Pain, A Formal Feeling Comes. That's a tough poem. And uh, I, I don't know if I were putting together an anthology, I, I would have selected that. But she had us um, read it and then called on students to explain it. And boy, did I slink down in my chair. I really didn't have the life experience to understand it. Um, but, but here was the miraculous thing. While I couldn't explain it, I did on some level understand it. And uh, that set me off on uh, really a search for the rest of my life to, to, uh, to really come to uh, learn what that quality in Dickinson's poetry was, was all about. Um, I moved out here to do a PhD at the University of Massachusetts. And uh, then several years later began teaching at Mount Holyoke College where I taught a seminar on Dickinson in her in her very rooms, where she wrote the wrote, where she wrote the poems, the college and the and the Dickinson Museum were not that far apart. So it really has been a a, a lifelong journey for me in in studying Dickinson. Although I must say, for years and years and years, while I wanted to write a book, I didn't know what kind of a book I wanted to write. There were a lot of books I didn't want to write about Dickinson. So it's taken me a long time to figure out exactly how I would fashion a book on on the poet. Your book is so well researched. How did you do that? Was this like a collection of just researching over many years, or well, it it, it was researching over many years um, uh, and teaching over many years. Um, I'm a writer of narrative nonfiction, so uh, that that means I use the techniques of storytelling to tell a true story. So I spend an awful lot of time in archives, and lucky for me. Emily Dickinson's letters and her poems, uh, about half of them are at Amherst College, the other half are at Harvard University. So living in Western Massachusetts, I was positioned in a, in a good spot. But, um, but in addition to her letters and poems, I also wanted to range widely to try to bring the times in which she lived. Um, there was a, a chapter that began with Dickinson coming back from Boston, where she was being treated for an eye disorder. She had what today we would call iritis, where bright lights bothered her a great deal. When she came back from that sojourn, all she wanted to do was read Shakespeare because she had been denied reading books. And she wrote a letter in which she said she 
uh, went up to the attic of her home, which was dimly lit, and began to read one of the, the Henry history plays. So I called up my friends who run the, the Dickinson Museum and said, can I get in the attic? Um, can I climb up there and, and see what the light is like? Can I read a little bit of, of Shakespeare up there to see what the, what the sound would, how, how the sound would reverberate? So in addition to archives and letters and poems, I wanted very, very tactile experiences as well that, that uh, thank goodness I live here, that I, that I could um, be able to reconstruct those for the reader. You focus on 10 moments in her life basically days or you know short spans of time that changed her in some way or made her evolve as a writer well that that was the tough thing um i, I didn't want to write an academic book uh that's not what i do i didn't want to write what's called a cradle to grave biography that had already been done so that's what took me so long in trying to come up with the conceit for this book and it really came from my students um I noticed that my Montholyuk students um, in the seminar, that when I wrapped the lesson around a particular day in Dickinson's life, they seemed to really get it. They really seemed to be more enlivened than, than usual. Um, so for example, there was a moment in Dickinson's life when she was a student at Mount Holyoke Female Seminary, the forerunner of the college, when she went head to head with the founder over questions of faith. So that day when we were reading poems about faith and doubt, I wrapped the lesson around this, this, this one pivotal moment and, and they, they seemed to really like it. So I thought, well, that must be able to translate in some way. You know, can I come up with 10? This happened to be a round number, um, days that were similar. And, and choosing those days was great fun. I, uh, uh, I was president of the, of the Emily Dickinson International Society for a while, and I, I called up my friends, other scholars, and said, which days would you choose? And uh, they gave me some great advice. Some days I loved the, the notion of them, but I couldn't use. For example, Dickinson had this... Um, this big shaggy dog named Carlo that followed her all around. Just loved Carlo. Most people think he was a, a big drooling Newfoundland. And um, they said, do a day when she got Carlo. Well, we don't know the day that she got Carlo. She doesn't mention that in the letter. And I was adamant that I wanted very specific days, you know, like Tuesday, August the 7th, 1862. It couldn't just be around a moment. So some of those days I had to throw out. So I, I choose ones, ones that uh, uh, most everybody suggested a day when she wrote a famous letter to a, an Atlantic monthly writer. Uh, others happen to be my favorites. Um, and I wanted to have the beginning be when she was young, when we first kind of hear her voice, when I heard her voice for the, for the first time, her poetic voice. I wanted to end it with the day she died. So the days span her life from the time she was about 14 until she died at age 55. So they're chronological, but they're not consecutive. What was your favorite moment in her life when you were looking for those 10 pivotal moments? So the day that I think I liked the most was when she was about in her 20s and she was writing a letter to a cousin and recalling a day um, that they had spent together a couple of months early. And the letter goes something like this, the lines go, uh, do you remember that October morning when our families went out riding in a carriage and you and I in the dining room decided to be distinguished? It's a great thing to be great, she said. So I love that ambition. I love that thinking large. Um, I, I, I love that commitment to doing it big, you know, and, and so um, that, was, that was one of the things I think that I brought that was somewhat new to our understanding of Dickinson, that there, uh, there was this ambition. Now, of course, Dickinson didn't publish all that much in her lifetime. She published only about a dozen poems, um, mainly in newspapers during her life, and a lot of questions about that. You know, why, why didn't she publish more? But I think it had to do with, um, uh, you know, Dickinson took the long view, <laughs> and and she uh, and she had a very difficult time also letting go of poems. She was always rewriting them, sometimes years, decades later. So uh, when she says, "I want it to be distinguished," I think she was saying, "This is life's work that I'm going to set out here, and I'm going to do it the way I want to see it." 
and in the time that it will take me to do it. And that didn't necessarily mean write a poem, send it off, get it published. She had a very different perspective on that. She does come across in your book as someone who's ambitious and very passionate about her poetry. And a lot of things along the way interfered with that, you know, um, kind of the domestic things that were expected of a woman in the 19th century. And she was pretty fierce about wanting to have that time with her writing. She was, that, that's, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, the Dickinsons were an upper middle class family. Uh, uh, they could afford to hire help, but that didn't mean that Dickinson was left off of, of doing the household chores, all of which really fell to the women in, in the house. And uh, yeah, she didn't like that. She groused a lot about uh, um, what she called household ha housekeeping. She saw as a pestilence was, <laughs> was, was her word. And um, she did love baking. She was the family baker, but she would, uh, she would demand time alone. And that, and that meant not, not the, you know, shirking off on her duties of the household, but that usually meant in seeing other people. By her late twenties, by her early thirties, she was making very firm decisions about who she would see and who she wouldn't, because she was using that that time to uh, to devote to her work. And the greatest gift I think that her family gave her, her parents and siblings, an older brother, a younger sister, uh, was that they uh, left her alone. You know that they respected what what she was doing, and I think that was a a, a huge benefit to her. I also got the sense in your book, in reading it, just sort of the overall lifetime development of a writer. Yes, um, I think sometimes we mistakenly think that writers are inspired, you know, that they, don't, that they don't have to work at it, that the words just come to them. Um, we were mentioning early, earlier, Kathy, that I, I write in a, in a cabin um, outside of my house here in the woods. And um, just uh, above my desk, I have a, a photocopy of Dickinson's poem, One Sister Have I in the House. It was um, a very, very early poem. What I like about that is every single line is crossed off, is crossed out. <laughs> it's, it's, and very, very vigorously, you know, as, as if this isn't right, this isn't right, this isn't right. So she was a hard task master on herself. And um, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, lines would stay in her head, seemed like forever. Uh, sometimes she would use a line in a letter that I would see later in a poem. And of course, sometimes she, uh, uh, she would return to a poem and change it. Um, and in fact, uh, Dickinson's poetry uh, is a real um, challenge for editors because she would write and rewrite. And on the manuscript page, you would see sometimes six adjectives stacked up on top of one another. You know, you can see her mind saying, no, nope, maybe this one, no, nope, maybe that one. She didn't circle the one she liked. So, so when an editor sits down to say, okay, what is a Dickinson poem? The editor is making very, very subjective decisions about which of those six adjectives to choose. So she was um, very workmanlike at, at, uh, at, at her verse. Um, and she was also constantly attuned to it. We have one of Dickinson's dresses uh, that has somehow been passed down through, through the centuries. And I love that it has a pocket. Uh, uh, Dickinson, when she would have a dress made, would indicate how she wanted it. And you know, a person who's writing all the time has um, has paper, uh, has a pencil in their pocket, and uh, I think that was we can even see in Dickinson's dress, you know, how how she was so committed to poetry. And she had some good readers who helped her along the way. She shared a lot with her sister-in-law Sue or Susan. Um, Austin's wife, her brother's wife. Um, and I remember a section early on when she was sort of developing, I think, her own aesthetic and wanted more imagery going against some of Sue's recommendations. That was, a, I think, a moment. It felt like a moment when she really kind of found a little bit more of her own voice and identity as a writer. She was pretty I, young. 
I, I think that is true. And in fact, that, that poem, uh, Safe in Their Alabaster Chambers, it's a poem that deals, as many of Dickinson's poems do, with uh, death and the, and the afterlife. And it's the only poem in existence that we have so far, you know, unless one turns up, that we see the back and forth between uh, Emily drafting the poem, sending it just across the lawn. Her brother and sister-in-law live just about 150 steps away from, from her house and the house next door. And then Sue would comment on it and it would come back. And uh, I think there are something like seven drafts of that poem. And uh, the, the stanzas become very, very different. Sue initially said, you know, that first stanza is so great, don't write another. I don't think you have another in you. Well, that was like throwing down the gauntlet. So um, Dickinson wrote another and another and another. And you're right, the imagery gets bigger and bigger, more abstract. It ends with, uh, with the poet almost being somewhere in outer space, looking down on the, on the insignificance of life. And, uh, and she went against what Sue instructed her to do, but, but certainly Sue was one of her most astute readers. Dickinson shared more poems with her sister-in-law than with anyone else in her life, but others helped her as well. Um, uh, including editors who uh, who wanted to publish more of her poetry. You know, it, again, if you if you know kind of just some of the basic myths of Dickinson, you think, well, she was misunderstood. Nobody really could uh, fathom her poetry. But she had editors in Boston. She had editors in New York um, who really wanted more, and she was the one who put the brakes on it. And and I think put the brakes on it because she was continuing to. Um, to tweak them, to, to edit them. You talk about the subject of death and how it seems that a lot of her poems concern that, yet she was sort of rebelliously almost not religious at a time when religion was very much a part of the fabric of the society. Uh, uh, Dickinson was the only member of her immediate family not to join the church. She attended, but she didn't formally join. Um, and to my judgment, I think that's because she was always thinking about it. You know, it, it was never just a done deal. Uh, the idea of faith and doubt very, very much occupied her mind. There's a, a famous poem that many people know that begins, some keep the Sabbath going to church, I keep it staying at home with a bobolink for a chorister and an orchard for a dome. I think she saw uh, heaven as heaven on earth. And the natural world was the source of great, um, uh, had a great sustaining power and also a, a source of poetic inspiration for her. So it was a, a lifelong struggle with her notion um, of, of a higher power. Since you live in Western Massachusetts and you're very familiar with the um, geography and the, the way nature presents itself, I think that really came alive in your book because she was so in tune to nature. I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. Uh, I, I think you're quite right in saying that, that Dickinson was very much attuned to nature. And um, one of the, the, the most fun uh, of all of the resources that I, I used was a big weather journal from an Amherst College professor who was a neighbor of Dickinson's named Ebenezer Snell. And he was kind of a quirky guy. I, I, uh, I really kind of fell in love with him. And every day of his adult life, he kept a big, big journal that recorded um, the temperature, the humidity, what the clouds looked like, and, and even further details about if there was a parhelion around the sun or something like that. So because I wanted to immerse Dickinson in, the, in her own here and now, I, uh, I used that weather journal to begin every single chapter to say what, what the weather was like. And because I wanted to really evoke the quotidian, you know, the, the dailiness of, of her life, a part of her, the, the story you tell, some of the book took place with the backdrop of the Civil War going on. How do you think that affected her? I think it affected her profoundly for a very long time. I think Dickinson scholars um, said, you know, there's no Civil War in Emily Dickinson. Even though her dates are 1830 to 1886 and the peak of her literary productivity is the 1860s, because she doesn't use the word Appomattox, 
Gettysburg, you know, because those those um, very, very specific res references don't appear in the poems, we mistakenly thought there is no civil war in Dickinson. But she was um, uh, very much affected by it. The One of the first young men from the town of Amherst to die in the Civil War was a young man named Frazier Stearns. He was the son of the president of Amherst College. And in Amherst, that would be like, you know, the crown prince uh, being killed in the war. That that rocked her, that, that devastated her brother, who was a good friend of his. Um, and what I found when putting together the date of his death and uh, when Emily Dickinson sent out her first letter to the to an essayist with for the Atlantic Monthly, sort of introducing herself as a poet, that those two events happened back to back. So I think that uh, uh, you know, not not surprisingly, um, the many many deaths that happened during the war, the uh, marching that happened on the town common that she could hear from her bedroom gave her a sense that life is short and that if you want to make your move, you should make your move and do what you think you were born to do in this world. So it is against that, that, that backdrop, I think that she really felt impelled to action and, um, and sent out to Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who, who was that essayist in the Atlantic Monthly, who had written an article that was kind of a how to be a writer article, a complete stranger to him, to her, that she sent out those four letters, um, those four poems, those first four initial poems to him, uh, which really was her introduction to the larger world. I had that sense as well, that she felt a sense of urgency at that point. I think I think that's true. Um, that it was just a, a a keen sense that life could change on a dime, and that if you wanted to do something, you had to take the initiative and and do it then. It was probably the most uncharacteristic um, move of her life. I mean, she at, at well, she had been writing many many poems before she wrote to Higginson. She didn't tell him that. She sort of lied in the letter and, and presented herself as a, as a novice, but she had many poems behind her and including some publications. But it, it was that, that sense of urgency that, uh, uh, that she needed to um, uh, stake out her place. Uh, and ambition comes in there as well, that, that theme of ambition that she had the, um, the confidence to say, uh, here it is, this is what I'm doing. Higginson like her sister-in-law Sue gave her some advice that she didn't take. <laughs> uh, but uh, that, that friendship that began when she was 31 years old and that lasted to the end of her life um, very much sustained her. And I think Higginson eventually understood who he was dealing with, that this really was a genius and uh, kind of like the attitude her parents had, get out of her way. She knows what she's doing. So Emily Dickinson is sort of an enigma to a lot of us, and we may sort of dismiss her or just think of her as a recluse. But not only did she have a pretty, a very vivid life of the mind, but she also had some romances along the way in her letters that appear. Right. Um, uh, Dickinson wrote four letters to someone she only identified as the master. And the letters are like nothing else she ever wrote. They are passionate, they are anguished, um, they are in some ways presenting herself as defeated, as annihilated by uh, the, the lack of returned love. And uh, we don't know exactly who the master was. And I know when I set out, when I, you know, you have to write a book proposal before you write a book. And when I was writing the book proposal, I said, I'm going to find who, out who the master was. Well, I couldn't. <laughs> you know, there are, there are many theories about it. Some include, uh, maybe it was just kind of a figment that she was a figment of her imagination that, that she was playing with. And again, it's unclear if she ever um, sent the letters. But there certainly seemed to be a lot of a lot of passion there. 
later in her life, Dickinson wrote um, a number of letters to uh, a man who was um, older than she was, a man of her father's generation, Otis Lord. He was a, a judge in Salem, Massachusetts. Um, they were, he was kind of around the family a lot uh, uh, during Dickinson's middle years. And, and clearly those, those letters indicate that there was a, a romance there and, and even talk of marriage. Um, he died before uh, uh, they, they could get together. But uh, you said Dickinson lived a very, we know that Dickinson lived a, a very uh, vivid life of the mind. And just to say a few words about that, I remember when I sent off my uh, first sample chapter to my editor and it happened to be a chapter about the Civil War. And there's a great deal in there about um, battles and, and it dealt with the death of Fraser Stearns. And it came back from my editor and she said, you know, um, I think you need to redo this. And uh, the reason I think you should do that uh, is that we're not inside Emily Dickinson's head as much as we should be. And, you know, you get a comment like that from the editor and that sets you back on your heels a little bit and you say, oh, you know, you work so hard on it. You spent months working on that chapter. And then after I sort of got down off of my high horse about that, I realized she was right. I had to change my notion of what action was when talking about Emily Dickinson. You know, you think about action, you usually think about things that, uh, you know, battles, people coming and going. But with Emily Dickinson, action is thought. So instead of reading her letters for what happened, who visited, who went where, I began to read them uh, for what she was thinking about. And that really was a sea change for me. It was a very, very different way for me to um, get inside her, uh, uh, or thinking about her, and um, I was glad for the advice from my from my editor. Later in life, in around I guess it was a, the 1880s or so, later and later in your book, she suffered a lot of losses personally. She had lost her eyesight, and then you know her to some extent, or had troubles with her eyesight earlier in life than that. But that was continuing, and then her mother, her father, her friend Helen, a beloved nephew, they all kind of you know, died in like, you know, a, a certain period of time there in the 1880s. How did that impact her at that time? And did she write any poems out of that? Oh, sure. Um, uh, many, many poems, uh, not only from that period, but even earlier in her life that that deal with loss. Um, I think uh, she, she writes in a letter uh, during that period in the 1880s saying the deaths have been too deep for me. And, but, but what is important to understand, I think, is that uh, she never stopped writing, you know, that, that writing was this life force. And the last words that she wrote were to uh, cousins that she was so close to, the ones that she earlier in her life had talked about being distinguished. Um, her last words were little cousins called back. Uh, and those are actually the words on her tombstone. They seem so perfectly evocative for somebody like, like Emily Dickinson. But I think that, uh, that writing was always a way for Dickinson out of grief, uh, for out of any sort of turbulence in her life, that, that it was not only what sustained her, but also what gave her definition, what gave her purpose. So she, she never quit, quit writing, almost up to the, to the day she died. Bartha Ackman, the book is These Fever Days, 10 P Pivotal Moments in the Making of Emily Dickinson. Uh, it's available at Left Bank Books, and I am so happy to have talked to you today. This was so enjoyable. We could just go on and on. Thank you for being with us. It was a pleasure, Kathy. Thank, thanks so much. Mm -hmm.